Uh, very good afternoon to each one of you. Uh, this is an interesting topic I am discussing today. And the uh, title is a bit vague, Turning the Tide. Uh, it has nothing to do with Navy of India, although tide is mentioned here. Turning the Tide, as we all know, is a kind of idiom which describes that something is happening and we want to change the course of events. We want to make something happen the way we want and change the course of event which is going against us. So turning the tide means going against the wind and winning, which is very important. And in this, we are going to discuss the incredible battle of Pratapgarh. Uh, Pratapgarh battle, most of us have heard in our, uh, particularly people from Maharashtra, have heard in their school time. Many times skits are played of this Pratapgarh battle, particularly the battle between Shivaji and Afzal Khan and all these things. But there is a lot behind the actual culmination of the battle. So we will discuss all those things. And we will also talk about what caused the battle, how the battle was won, and what really happened after the battle, which is very important. Uh, only yesterday, we celebrated, I think, 346th uh, anniversary of the coronation of King Shivaji. Shivaji was the first local king, when I say local means the king who considered himself to be an Indian, to be coronated after almost 230 years after the fall of uh, Vijayanagar. Vijayanagar fell at, in 1565 and Shivaji was the coronated king after that. Now, when you look at a banyan tree or when you look at a big uh, coconut tree, you can see the tree stop, you can see the fruits and the, the panorama and everything. But nobody thinks what was the cause of this tree, what was the seed for this tree. The coronation, if you consider as the tree of Swarajya, Swarajya means self-rule, then the cause or the seed of that tree was actually this battle of Pratapgarh. We'll move into the presentation now with this introduction as to what this battle was all about. This is a very nice shot of Pratapgarh. Pratapgarh is a fort in Maharashtra and uh, which is very close to the picnic spot of Mahabaleshwar, which most of us know. And there is a small anecdote about it. I will tell at the end of my talk. So this Pratapgarh is a fort created by Shivaji. It's, when I say created means that the mountain was already there, but all the fortifications were done under the instructions of Shivaji Maharaj. As we move in the story, we'll get to know. This is a good panoramic view of that fort. What was the situation before Shivaji even came on the scene. India, this is the map of India, medieval India. And when we start uh, looking at history, right in the year 632, 632, a ship of pirates, Arab pirates came near Chendwani Naka in Thane and did a kind of jihad and they massacred the local uh, Fisher, uh, fishermen folk and the local people. That was the first taste of India towards this new menace of jihad. So in 632, it has started. It was an isolated incident. It happened only in Thane. But then soon, what happened, not very soon, but in 90 years, in year 711, Muhammad bin Qasim from the deserts of Arabia came all the way up to Sindh. And he had a big fight with the local uh, <coughs> local king, Raja Dahir, and that fight ultimately ended into the defeat of Raja Dahir, and Sindh, since then had become a province under the Muslim Sultanate. At that time, it was under the Sultanate of uh, Mecca Matina, then it moved uh, hands, it went to Baghdad, Iraq, then it went to uh, the local Mughal Sultanate. So Sindh had been ceded from India in that manner. Uh, people think that that's the beginning of the end of uh, India's independence, but it took almost 300 years before the next attack came in 1008. This attack was by Mahmud Gajanavi. He's a very famous for the, the kind of uh, looting he did at Somnath. And he came and he had a fight with a king called Raja Anangapal, who was a king of Punjab, and he defeated Anangapal. And thus Punjab started slowly coming under the occupation of the invaders. After the 1008, we have 1193, this is Mahmud Ghori, who actually had a fight with the then king of uh, Kanoj, and the fight was at Tarori, which is uh, northwest of Delhi, 
and in which Prithviraj on the earlier year in 1192 he had defeated Mahmud, but in the next year Mahmud came again. Mahmud came from uh, Afghanistan, Ghazni came from Ghaznavi, which is Ghaznavi came from Ghazni, and Mahmud also came from Afghanistan, and then he captured the throne of Delhi. He went back, he left his uh, vassal Kutubuddin Aibak, and the uh, Mughal rule started in Delhi after that time. Till then, it was, uh, it was only limited to Delhi and surrounding. But soon, we found that uh, there was another uh, Turkish uh, Sultan called Alauddin Khalji. And in the year 1308, he traveled all the way down south and he captured the fort of Devgiri. This was the time when the area where we are living came under the occupation of the invaders. The invading people were of the Turkish origins, Turkish, Iranian, Arabic, uh, Afghan, they were from mixed breed, but the rulers were always considered themselves as the Turkish rulers. So 1308, uh, independent, Maharashtra as we consider now, independent was lost. Then came 1510, when another power came into Indian scene. These were the Portuguese. They were looking for a road to, or, or, a, or a route, a naval route to India, which could bypass the Arabian Peninsula. And Vasco de Gama succeeded in 1498 to come into, 1498, he came into India. He came to Calicut, but later on in 1510, the Portuguese came and they conquered Goa. They actually established a colony in Goa. It took us almost 460 years to oust them from Goa in 1961. So this way it was going on. So most of the India was coming under invasion, but there was one bright spot that was in Vijayanagar. The Vijayanagar kingdom was still going strong, but in 1565, uh, Vijayanagar was established in 1300 and about, and in 265 years, 1565, uh, it was Vijayanagar kingdom was defeated by combined armies of five different uh, invading kingdoms. They are called the Bahamani kingdoms in Maharashtra and nearby. And they defeated, and that, that, that was the end of the last local king in India. Vijayanagar was gone. Vijayanagar was gone, and then what started, in the words of one famous historian, as a 300 years of dark ages. 300 years of dark ages, because from 1565 to 1660s, uh, not 1660 to almost 1659, why we'll come to know why it is 1659, uh, it uh, so appeared that. The entire region of India, uh, bearing a few small states in the deep south, were under invasive, invasive occupation. And the invading occupation was very tough to live in. The locals were not given any rights. Locals were not given any means of survival. They were only to be slaves. They were supposed to do, uh, generate wealth for the kings, and the kings would spend the wealth as they want. I talked about the Bahamani kingdoms. These are this is a, in this map. You can see there are five Bahamani kingdoms: the uh, the Bidar, Barichai of Bidar, Golconda, which is uh, close, which is the current Hyderabad, which was a Kutub Shahi, Ahmednagar, which is uh, very close to Pune, was a Nizam Shahi of Ahmednagar, Bijapur was the biggest of them, which was the Adil Shahi, and Bijapur actually took over the remaining land of Vijayanagar. And Berar was Imad Shai, there were five of them. And the five of them ruled in unison, but they kept fighting amongst themselves also at the same time. But they also realized that were fighting forces. Remember, these were actually the kings and uh, uh, marauders who came from outside India. And there was a limit to how many people could come from outside India. So they had to increase the number of uh, soldiers, they had to increase the number of bureaucrats, their, the practices were of twofold. One is convert the local people from Hindus to Muslims and induct them into services. And the people who couldn't be converted try to induct them into their armies and uh, lower bureaucracies. Uh, they found that the Marathas in the Maharashtra region were very good fighters. They were very rugged and tough and they could fight for uh, money and they could fight in a very ferocious manner. So they, the Marathas were recruited as small uh, uh, lords with their armies. One such lord was a great man called Shahaji Raja Bhosle. Shahaji Raja Bhosle's family comes from a small town near El Elora. It's from Marathwada region. And he worked for this uh, Nizam Shahi, which is in Ahmednagar, which was in Ahmednagar at that time. So he worked as their vassal. And he was fighting whom, at the same time, on the top, you will see it was all the Mughal Empire. Shahajan was ruling at that time. And Shahajan came down to conquer 
Dakkan. This whole region south of Narmada was called uh, south of uh, Narmada was called Dakkan, Dakkan and uh, in English it is called Deccan, from where the name Deccan Queen comes, by the way. And uh, this uh, region was being conquered by Mughals. They were trying to conquer it for all the time, and in the end, they actually finished the Nizam Shahi. Remember, Nizam Shahi was also of an Islamic uh, sect. Uh, Shah Jahan was also Islamic sect, but most of the five Bahamani kingdoms were Shias, whereas Shah Jahan was from the Sunni sect of Islam. So he was always the, the Mughals were always against going into uh, against uh, removing the Shia influence and bringing their own empire down south. So in the end, there was a big fight between the Ahmadnagar uh, Nizam Shahs and uh, uh, Shah Jahan. The fight was at a uh, small locality called Bhatudi, which was won by Shahaji. Shahaji and his mentor, was, his name was Malikambar. They together won that flight, the fight. But at the end, the Mughal might prevailed and Shah Jahan uh, one uh, Shia Chajan finished the Nizam Shahi kingdom and then uh, you know when your company is uh, closed you have to move to another company so likewise Shahaji moved to Adil Shahi but at the same time Shahajan who has realized the worth of Shahaji he told Adil Shah that send this person down south don't keep him in the Sayyadris because he's too powerful here accordingly Shah, Shahaji was sent down south he is actually one who founded the city of Bangalore and he went to Bangalore and uh, started uh, ruling from there, started working for Adil Shah there. But at the same time, he had a small principality left in Pune, which he, in which he put his wife, he had two wives, his elder wife, uh, Jijabai, and his uh, younger son from Jijabai, Shivaji, both of them he kept in Pune. And they told him that to guard this, uh, this Jahagir or this small area, and that's how Shivaji came to guard that area. But Shivaji was a young boy at that time, he was to help him out. He, uh, Shahaji sent some of his uh, best people. One of them was Dadoji Kundev, who was a very good administrator. Another was Kanoji Jede, who was a very good army person and well versed in the art of guerrilla tactics. Because in the Sayyadris, in the mountains, guerrilla tactics were what Shahaji was very good at, and that's how he was winning. He was winning the wars. So Shivaji started growing in Pune, and his mother, Jizabai, she has an interesting heritage. She comes from her father was named Lakuji Yadav. Yadav and Yadav are uh, uh, synonyms in uh, Indian history. Lakuji actually comes, uh, came from the lineage of Devgiri's Ramdev Rao Yadav, who was defeated by Alauddin Khalji in 1308. So Jizabai kept telling Shivaji stories about the self-rule, the, the, uh, the wealth they had seen, the good ruling they had seen. And Shivaji grew up to believe that we should have a rule of our own. And that's how the it was the birth of Swarajya or the beginning of the uh, self-rule concept within Shivaji's mind. This picture of Shivaji, which is many of us have seen, is actually uh, taken, uh, it's uh, drawn by a live portrait uh, drawer in uh, Agra, where Shivaji was visiting Agra, and currently it is in the uh, British Museum. So this is, a, this is actually, there's no imagination here, this is as you saw, as close to the photograph as we can go. So Shivaji started growing in influence and he started uh, 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 to grow his uh, small empire. It was very small actually, but in the process of growing, uh, he came into conflict with the Adil Shahi empire because uh, Pune Jagir actually, although it was owned by Shahaji, it was part of the Adil Shah's uh, domain. So Adil Shah then sent a force of uh, his uh, a small detachment to fight against Shivaji. Shivaji actually fought that battle. He sent his forces uh, near, near Purandar Fort. It was called Khalad Belsar. Uh, the, near Khalad and Belsar, two towns were there. So this battle, Shivaji's forces won. And uh, Fateh Khan, who was the general of the Adil Shah forces, he had to run away. So then Adil Shah started saying that Shivaji is not a... Till then, he was considered as a brat of one of his vassals. But then he realized there is something different. But then Shivaji also did a strategy game. He, he started becoming a strategist by then. So he decided that to start self-rule, you need money. And where is money in our region? Because our region is very woeful in, the, we don't have the uh, plains like uh, central India, like Ganga and Jamna, and we are very bad in the crops and all. So where to get money from? And it seemed that there was a piece called Jauli. Jauli is a deeply forested, region. Even now the forest is deep. This is the current photograph. 
uh, you can imagine in those days how deep it would have been. But Jauli was at a very interesting location. If we see the map of Maharashtra, uh, the, the, this is the current map of Maharashtra, Jauli actually fell into a small area. This green area is Jauli. That's where the Jauli forest is. The blue area on this side is actually coast of Maharashtra. Now you see the Adil Shahi and all the Bahamani kingdoms, they also wanted to have a connection with the rest of the world. And the rest of the world connection earlier used to be through the Khyber Pass that was close to them because of the Mughal emperors. So their connection was the sea, the sea routes. And there were some good ports along this blue path, which is the coast of India. Bombay was nowhere in picture then. But the ports of Jaigar, Dabol, and Mahar. Mahar was also a port, and they were all there at that time. And all the goods came from Arabia and other places into India through ships, and they were loaded on uh, caravans of uh, bullocks, and uh, the caravans uh, carried them across the Sayadri to the empire of Vijaypur. This is where the Vijapur is there. So this was the caravan route. And they had to pass through Jauli because that was the only viable way to cross this long range of Sanyadris. So when they passed through Jauli, actually what they did, they had to pay Oktrai, uh, whatever we call Oktrai, it was called Jakat then. So Jakat was to be paid. So anybody who was in charge of Jauli was getting rich because of the Jakat business. At that time, the king of Jauli or the, the Jagirdar of Jauli was one Mr. More, one uh, Chandra Rao More, and uh, his, uh, he actually was put on the throne by help of Shivaji, because Shivaji had his eyes on Jauli at that time. So Shivaji put uh, Chandra Rao More on throne in the hope that Chandra Rao will help him against his flight with Adil Shah. But Chandra Rao was a very arrogant person. He knew that Jauli was impenetrable because of the forest and the mountains and all. So he challenged Shivaji that if you really want to control me, you have to come and see for yourself. Shivaji dispatched his troops. Shivaji knew guerrilla warfare better than Chandra Rao. And he actually captured Chandra Rao's step whole area. So Shivaji became the king of Jauli. And then the alarm makes, bell started ringing in the Vijapur fort, Vijapur's uh, fort, because they realized that Shivaji is now has got his finger on the jugular. He can stop the traffic coming into Vijapur. The most important part of that traffic were the Arabian horses. Arabian horses are what we call today the tanks in current uh, terminology. They were the, the, the main state of the army of Adil Shah. And if the Arabian horses cannot come into Adil Shah, their armies will start getting weaker. Plus, the Arabian horses will be picked by Shivaji at will. And that's why they had to do something about this brat Shivaji. So they decided to do something from there. And when Shivaji was having Jauli under his command, he realized there was a big mountain there called Bhorpa. Bhorpa was the local name of the mountain. He knew that to keep control of the Jauli to him, he needed a proper fortification there. So he told his associate, Moro Pajita Pingle, that you go and build a first class, uh, well, good quality, defensible fort there. And within two years, believe it or not, within two years, uh, uh, Moropanta built a wonderful fort, which is standing even till now. In 1658, the fort construction was completed. 1656, it started. And this fort is the Pratapgarh fort, which is the centerpiece of our discussion today. So Pratapgarh, this is the fort he built. This is the Pratapgarh. Once again, you see the majestic view and the mountains and the jungles around. Uh, when Shivaji built a fort, there is a little bit about the fort, how a fort should be. He built it in the best defensive position. Why I'm showing you this piece. This here is the main gate of Pratapgarh. And as you can see, you cannot approach the main gate directly. To approach the main gate directly is not possible because uh, there are, there is, you can see there is a, a kind of a maze around the main gate here and here like that. The reason for that is the way to crash a main gate was using elephants. Elephants will run at the main gate and crash the main door. Here there is no space for the elephants to run. So elephants can't run. And if by mistake some elephant came, he would be dead here because main gate would have spikes on them. And to remove the dead elephant would be another major project for the invading army. So this is the way the forts were built. Another way the fort, uh, fortification speciality is when you climb any fort in Maharashtra, you will find that the mountain is on your right. The staircase or the path is so designed that the mountain is on your right, so that your sword arm is towards the mountain. You can't have a free run with your sword arm. Well, the defenders would come from top, their sword arm, which is the right, 
uh, usually people are right handed and which will be on a free run and it will be very difficult to fight in such a sense. So these were the special uh, pr uh, provisions Shivaji and his team made and thus the Pratapgarh fort was made. Now how does the Pratapgarh fort looks from top? This is the Google map photo. It looks like a butterfly and you can see in this fort there are different uh, bastions. This is the main gate which I showed you just now, the Mahadwar. Next to the main gate, these are the Buruj means bastion. Buruj are the defensible positions where uh, cannons can be put, ammunition can be put, and it can be used to defend the fort. And this Buruj, this Buruj, by the way, is called Abjal Buruj, which is a corruption of the name. Its original name was Tehalni Buruj. Tehalni Buruj means a watchtower, uh, a Buruj, which is a bastion which is used for uh, watching. But Abdul Khan had to die next to the Buruj to give his name to the Buruj. We'll come to that later. This is how the fort is made. Uh, all this time, the Adil Shah, the, the Emperor Muhammad Adil Shah, who is shown here in the center, was getting old and getting sicker, and he actually died. When he died, this is actually, you can see his sardars. You can see the difference in color from these sardars. Actually, he had in court various people with different colors and youth. Some of these were from the Abyssinian area, Ethiopia today. Some of these were, these are the local Indian people. And this is from his own location, which is Persia or uh, Iraq or wherever he came from. So these were all uh, people of different uh, hues and colors. And sure enough, there was always an internecine battle between these different people. So this is Adil Shah died and his stepson took place. His name is uh, Muhammad Adil Shah again. And he was, uh, he, he was put on throne by his scheming stepmother. Her name is, uh, in, in, in a historical book, she's called Badi Sahibin. She was the sister of the king of Golconda, Qutub Shah. And she was well versed in the statecraft right from then. So she knew what to do in statecraft. And she was a very scheming woman. When she realized what is happening with Shivaji, she decided that Shivaji had to be stopped. And who will stop it? Because they wanted to have some powerful army general to go for this particular task. And then they found one such general. His name was Abdul Khan. On the left, you see the portrait of Abdul, Abdul Khan. It was a portrait drawn in his time. It's a contemporary one. On the right, you see a portrait, again, of the same person. But it is more on, from the traditional way of drawing a portrait. Now, this Abdul Khan, a little bit about him. He was a very tall, uh, six and a half feet tall and equally wide. He was a very massive a person of a massive build, cunning, ruthless, and completely without any uh, conscience or without any morals. He was known to be a person without any morals and very cruel at the same time, but very capable. He was a son of an ordinary cook. It is rumored that he was a bastard from the uh, Muhammad Adil Shah himself, but he was an ordinary cook's son. But by sheer great determination and cunning, he had risen to the become the best noble in the army. Plus, importantly, he also had a running feud with Shahji. Shahji was a major uh, uh, sardar in the Bijapur uh, court, but our uh, Abdul Khan had a very uh, running feud with Shahji. He had also arranged to have Shahji's elder son. <laughs> In one, in one particular uh, uh, siege in uh, Karnataka. And uh, so he was tasked to actually stop Shivaji. But to, uh, to incentivize this task, he was also given the Subedari of Wai. Wai is the region which is next to Jauli. So the idea was that uh, his own area will be in under attack from Shivaji. So he will have that much more uh, incentive to go and uh, fight Shivaji. So he was told to go and get Shivaji down. And he came from the court, said, he, in Marathi it is said, So I will go on a horseback, pull his, pull his ears, and bring him to the feet of our uh, emperor, Adil Shah. Shivaji knew of this. Shivaji had an extensive uh, espionage network across his region. He knew immediately that Abdul Khan has been tasked with this. At the same time, this is, this is the fate, actually. Another great personality was there in the same area. This great personality is Muhammad Aurangzeb. Aurangzeb was at that time Subedar. He was not still a king because his father was still uh, ruling. Shah Jan was still ruling. And he, by the way, had a taste of Abzal Khan medicine earlier. In one particular battle, Abzal Khan managed to capture Aurangzeb. And he said that Aurangzeb is under siege and I will capture him so that we can uh, then 
finish off a Mughal prince, so that the threat of Mughals will be gone forever. But his commander at that time was name was Khan Jahan. Khan Jahan was Khan Muhammad. Khan Muhammad was a, a prime minister of Bijapur. He gave the advice that we should not harm the Mughal prince because if he is harmed, the entire Mughal might will be turned against Adil Shah. So he released that uh, Aurangzeb. So Aurangzeb was alive thanks to Khan Muhammad. But then uh, Abdul Khan became furious. He came back to Vijapur. It is said that he came stomping the ground and told the Vijapur Adil Shah that this is not on. I had won this battle. And he had the prime minister murdered on the street of uh, Vijapur. Look at the power of this uh, Abdul Khan. Such was this Abdul Khan. So he was tasked to go and then uh, defeat Shivaji. So he went and he started preparing. When he was preparing, he met his uh, sadhu. He had a, some fakir in whom he had big trust. So the fakir said, I am seeing you without a head. So don't go for this particular battle. I think this is not good for you. So Abdul Khan said, no, no, I have taken the oath and I have to go and get this battle done. But in a, he realized that if something happens to him, all his, uh, he had 64 uh, wives. So he said all the 64 wives will be taken away by others. So what he did, he actually killed each one of them. There are 60 covers, very, not very far from Bijapur. The actual number of covers is 64. And all of these are shown here. And uh, he killed all these wives. And then he started uh, for the campaign. He said, when I come back, I'll get another 60 or maybe 120 wives. That's not a problem. So this is the cruelty of the person. So he started. Now, to start, he had to prepare. So in preparation, what, he, what was his army he prepared for? This is very interesting. He had a cavalry of 10,000. Infantry of 12,000, large cannons, 80, small cannons, about 300 plus, 1,200 camels, 85 elephants. And most importantly, he had supplies for three years. So he knew that he might be in for a longer haul. So he was preparing in a very big way against a small uh, evanescent Swarajya. Shivaji didn't have many forces and Shivaji had many enemies. The Mughals were there, the Siddhis were there, the Abdul Khan. Uh, Adil Shahs were there. So he had to split whatever forces he had. So Abdul Khan started with all these forces. Now, what was the route Abdul Khan took? This is an interesting concept. He didn't come from Vijapur straight to Pratapgarh. Here is Vijapur here. This is Vijapur and this is Pratapgarh, close to Mahabaleshwar. But he didn't come straight. What he did, he actually, he came this circuitous route which passed Pandarpur. As you can see, this is the Pandarpur. He actually went and damaged the idol in Pandarpur and had uh, cows killed because Hindus treated cows as sacred, had cows killed in the Pandarpur Mandir. This was to incite, to uh, let Shivaji know that you don't have any defenses, come and fight me. Agar dam hai to samne aay. This type ka kuch dialogue he gave. But Shivaji was a very wise king. He didn't do any of these things. Very close to Pandarpur, somewhere in this region, there is uh, Tuljapur, where the, the patron goddess of Shivaji, Bhavani, was, uh, uh, her murti was there. He also tried to damage the Bhavani murti. But uh, it was not possible to incite Shivaji from his location. Shivaji was deep inside Sahyadri. He was not facing Aurangya, uh, Abdul Khan. He knew that with this kind of force of our, uh, Abdul Khan, I won't be able to fight him in open battle at all. So that's how we, here you can see Fulton. Fulton is where Shivaji's uh, uh, son-in-law, Bajaji Nimbalkar, was there. He caught Bajaji, and Bajaji was a vassal of Vijapur. He caught him and he said, you have to become a Muslim. Bajaji refused. Then he said, you have to pay me if you don't want to become a Muslim. So he paid 60,000 gold coins just to keep his religion intact. So he was trying to incite Shivaji all this time without success. Then he came to Y. Y is where his uh, Subedari was there. So he came Y. There was a big uh, Subedar's uh, uh, palace was there. He's, this is not a Subedar's palace. This is today's Y, by the way, which has become very famous as a shooting spot. If you remember the movie Gangajal that was shot in this place. And this is River Krishna, which is treated as Ganga in Gangajal movie. Anyway, so he came to Y and camped in Y. He made Y as his base camp. All his great army he brought into Y. And this is Y. And this is Pratapgarh. Now, from Y to Pratapgarh, the road is very circuitous. Lot of forest there, lot of rivers to rivers and stream to uh, cross, and it's a tough road. So now he started telling Shivaji, "Come and meet me at Y. I will seek pardon for you from Adil Shah, and you will be very safe with me. I am like your uncle. Shahji is a close friend of mine. 
Shivaji then played a different strata game. You know, you have to play the game depending on the personality of the opponent. Shahjan was a very vain person. He was very arrogant, very proud of himself. So Shivaji said, I'm so afraid and I have done so many good things against the Adil Shah. I can't face you. I will not be able to face you. You please come and bless me in my own place. And he kept doing this through his uh, uh, Vakil. Vakil, by the way, is a Farsi term which actually means representative. It doesn't mean lawyer. And his Vakil was... Uh, Pantaji Gopinath, and uh, he was a Brahmin, and uh, Ab Abzal Khan's Vakil was Krishnaji Pantakulkarni, he was also a Brahmin. These Vakils talked with each other, they kept going to and fro, and Shivaji refused to come out of Pratapgarh. Then, it, the, uh, it's a continuous situation like that developed, and then it, uh, Abzal Khan realized, realized that Shivaji cannot be drawn out. If I want to finish this in one go, Shivaji offered that I want to meet you at my port. We'll have a one-on-one -on -one meeting. And then Abdul Khan said, oh, fantastic. Let us do actually a one-on-one -on -one meeting. No problem there. And accordingly, one second. he did the one-on-one -on -one meeting. And the terms of the meeting was set, scheduled at 10th of November, 1659. And the terms of the meeting were that both of the leaders would meet alone on a one-on-one -on -one in presence of their representatives, the wakils, each one. Both will carry only two personal arms of their own choice. Bodyguards for each one, one bodyguard each would be outside the tent. He would not be allowed in the tent. And 10 armed guards of each leader would be at a distance of a range of one arrow flight, which is 1,000 to 1,500 feet. No other army personnel of any sort will be allowed close to the meeting place. So this is the, these were the terms of the meeting. On the, uh, on the side, you can see here, uh, what Shivaji, no, you can't see it here. What Shivaji chose was a dagger and something known as tiger claws. I'll come to that in a moment, what the tiger claws are. So Shivaji chose the tiger claws and dagger and Abdul Khan chose a sword and a dagger. Now, <clears throat> the terms were set and the meeting place was put. Uh, we, we, I showed you that Abzal Buruj, uh, the Teherni Buruj, uh, down by the Buruj, there was an open space where the meeting place was put. But while going to that place, they had to cross what is known as the river Koena, which is not crossable in those areas. So he had to leave all his artillery, all his horse cavalry and most of his forces down below. He couldn't carry them to Pratapgarh as, it, as was designed by Shivaji in the process. So the meeting actually took place on the 10th of uh, November. The meeting time was put at 4 o'clock in the evening, 4.30 in the evening. It was winter, so the sunset would have been in an hour, hour and a half at that time. Uh, what Shivaji did, Shivaji prepared very exclusively for this meeting. I'll come to the strategy of the meeting also. And in the, in the process, what Shivaji did was Shivaji had camped all his army people in a very uh, secret locations all around Abdul Khan's army. And the idea was in the meeting, if something happens and Shivaji is not coming back, then there will be a signal by a cannon, uh, cannon shot will be fired, a signal will be given, and the army has to go and attack Abdul Khan, Abdul Khan's army. Even if Shivaji is safe, then also the signal was to attack Abdul Khan, but in a different manner. So the signaling process was in, the army was put. What you are seeing here is a film representation of the famous meeting in which Abdul Khan is a very tall, six and a half feet. Shivaji was five and a half feet as, uh, as is known, and of slight of build compared to Abdul Khan. So Abdul Khan actually took him into his uh, arms and uh, he said, come, you don't have to be afraid of me. Abdul Khan actually became very excited by getting his prize right next to him. It's like a cheese to a mouse, but he didn't know that who was the mouse and who was the cat. So Abdul Khan captured him and then uh, uh, after capturing, this is the famous portrait where Shivaji actually killed Abdul Khan in this process. Now, it is debatable. There are two points of debate here. What were the weapons Shivaji used to kill Abdul Khan? I have seen tiger claws myself. Tiger claws are to be worn on your uh, uh, five fingers and the claws get hidden when you close the uh, arm, close the uh, hand. When you open the hand, the claws come out. But the claws are one and a half to two inches of uh, length. Now, Abdul Khan having a body mass of uh, like six and a half uh, feet tall and six and a half feet wide almost, he would have a fat layer of at least four inches on his uh, uh, stomach. So this kind of uh, tiger claw would, wouldn't be able to hurt him at all. So Shivaji knew anatomy, I'm quite sure of it. So he had carried that big dagger, as you can see. So he used that dagger to cut across his uh, stomach. The story goes that Abdul Khan actually captured Shivaji into his armpit 
and took out the dagger which you can see here and he hit shivaji with the dagger but shivaji being the white king he had put chain mail inside his cloth here is all chain mail which is called chilkat in marathi and on the on the head also there was a helmet inside this jere uh, uh, top as the shivaji wears uh, that so the, the dagger didn't do much dagger actually came uh, cutting through the cloth of shivaji made a very screeching noise on the chain and shivaji instantly came into action and he cut through abdul khan's uh, uh, stomach it is said that his intestine started flowing out and abdul khan even though uh, all this had happened he was still mighty and if he carried his intest intestines in his arms and he started shouting daga daga and started walking out of the tent abdul khan's uh, bodyguard was called was known as sayyid bada sayyid it's called sayyid banda in some uh, 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 some book but bada sayyid was the name of the person and he was very good at uh, fighting with the sword his sword arm was very fast and long but bada sayyid came and shivaji had brought another bodyguard of his his name was jiu mahala jiu mahala was good at the sword and he could use the inflate the, the deflatable sword very effectively which is called dan patta he came immediately and he cut off the sword arm of bada sayyid and killed bada sayyid also so abdul khan was demolished in this process and then shivaji's strategy started taking place this is pratapgarh this is where the meeting place is there this is the tehrni bastion the uh, what is called abdul buruj now that just below that this is the place where they were meeting shivaji had put his army in a different locations on this side he has put his uh, infantry under murupanta peshwe and ragunath pant atre on the, this side there was netaji palkar who was with his cavalry and ragunath ballar atre was on this side with his infantry and then the the moment abdul khan was killed on the kinosh where which is where the murupanta was there uh, the moment the uh, cannon shot was fired indicating that this is going to be the battle time now and shivaji is safe and get on with it so they all started thinking, this is infantry started walking you know this is two and a half miles so they started walking and this is uh, they are about 10 kilometers from the 10 miles from the y and uh, abdul's main forces so they started on cavalry and this is how they started this is the this is the tehrni buruj this is the place where abdul khan was killed so you can see it is within the eye sight with a within a uh, line of sight is there so they started this is how the fight went this is the koina river koina river as i told you it was impassable so just before koina river abdul forces were there cannons were here infantry was here and cavalry was kept here so on from this side netoji palkar came with his cavalry on this side the infantry came from moropanta uh, uh, pingle and they all engaged this complete abdul camp into fight but the important point here is the the actual fight started around 7 o'clock in the evening the there was about 1000 soldiers very close to the meeting place here which were first disposed of by moropanta's uh, infantry and they they were so fast they were killed so swiftly that nobody could come back and tell what had happened so the people here the soldiers and everybody here was thinking that the meeting is going to be successful abdul is going to capture shivaji and we will all enjoy today so they were all in a very uh, very joyful mood enjoying biryani and all what not and suddenly out of the blue around 9 o'clock in the night or, or even about 12 o'clock midnight the forces of marathi forces came and attacked them and they were completely unprepared so the attack was hugely successful they came from all these places attacked abdul's forces and actually he, this is where the 1000 soldiers of afghan uh, uh, abdul khan was there which was finished by the infantry of moropanta and ragunath balla atre and then netoji came very swiftly with his cavalry and he engaged the cavalry of uh, abdul khan actually cavalry in the evening the horses are kept loose so to mount the horse takes 10 to 12 minutes there were no 10 to 12 minutes available they were all finished in this process and netaji didn't stop there he continued down to y on this route he went to y because y is where the main forces main base of abdul khan was there that's where all the goodies were there the treasure the treasury the uh, the ammunition the extra ammunition and everything was there so netoji actually went and completely destroyed this entire camp of abdul khan so abdul khan was finished there are nothing left of that person in the meantime moropanta's infantry kept on walking and they also engaged here and they finished this camp totally 
so here there was a person called baba ji bhosle he he was put here nobody knew he was there so he cut off the rear routes of this infantry camp so they couldn't go to why to tell what has happened and in this way the complete threat of abdul khan was finished and it was a great victory for shivaji but the great king that shivaji was he didn't start do the victory celebration there was no joyful occasion he said while the enemy is still unaware of what has happened let us hit them as fast as we can and the next plan started coming to action this is where abdul khan was killed this is the place in 1930 this is a side story in 1930 somebody put this type of small uh, shelter on a kind of tomb here abdul khan was killed but shivaji actually injured him another bodyguard of shivaji called sambhaji kauji he actually killed abdul khan because abdul khan was trying to run away so he went and cut off the feet of the the pal bearers of abdul khan and then killed abdul khan took his uh, uh, beheaded him and his head was then sent to rajgarh where shivaji's mom was there jizabai as a souvenir to shivaji's mom so actually there was only the pieces of abdul khan's body and said bada body uh, what is there i don't know who could put a tomb to that and all nobody has record there are no records of that in maratha chronicles marathas don't say that they have put a tomb somebody put a tomb there later on in 1938 nizam of hyderabad saw this tomb and then he said that this has to be made better so this is what he did with the tomb the entire construction is illegal now today's situation is this tomb or whatever they call it is actually put out of bounds there has been a garrison around it and nobody is allowed to go to the tomb or pray to the tomb so this is the current status of the abdul khan's tomb then after that shivaji started a three pronged attack on the enemies one prong uh, is uh, lieutenant doroji he went into konkan and he captured all the konkan uh, coast line another shivaji himself took a big force he went down to panala because just like prataphgarh held one route of this jakat panala held the other routes coming from coming from konkan into uh, uh, adil shahi kingdom so panala was to be captured and shivaji within month month time captured panala also at that same time neto ji to actually went 70 kilometers from bijapur athani was the place he went up to athani which is 70 miles or 70 miles from bijapur so the people of adil shahi dispensation were so much in awe and uh, fear that nobody could resist this kind of uh, uh, whirlwind campaign and shivaji had a major victory on hand and he actually showed that indians locals can fight the invaders and can win a battle of invaders and this is what is the importance of this battle because after this battle their moral building moral boosting happened and the indian soldiers from the i specifically say indian because they are the local soldiers so they also became very uh, they, they had a lot of courage and they started fighting very valiantly and they started capturing bigger and bigger territory this is shivaji maharaj on the way to uh, capture more territory down south panala and further down this event was of such a global importance that shivaji became known throughout the world throughout the known world that is and in europe this is from london gazette this is from a dutch newspaper they all started telling that some great king has come and which has simply finished a great uh, power center like abdul khan in no time and this was a great boost to the indian uh, morale on the whole and this is our hindustan after the not even 100 years passed when the maratha empire reached to the zenith and they went all the way 1700 kilometers to atok atok is now in pakistan but actually atok is on the uh, river atok which is very close to kabul and that is where the maratha soldiers who were this type of soldiers were light light cavalry soldiers they fought across all odds and won a great territory and this is the atok fort this is the fort of atok across the river this is the river this side is india this side is the river then atok at that time it was india only but uh, this was the zenith of maratha power this is in 1758 not in 1659 but look at in uh, less than 100 years maratha that small battle of prataphgarh gave way to an empire and later on the empire looked something like this this was the left portion of mogal empire rest all is maratha as you can see this is entire territory is under maratha empire and when it started it was only this much empire very close to pune and surrounding and this is how marathas won and this is how the tide was turned that's why i call prataphgarh battle as the 
the time when the tide was done a little postscript to this uh, story the story is itself great and i am i will be very happy to answer questions after the talk but an interesting postscript to this story uh, there was a great man in 1956 Uh, uh, 1955, 1955 and 56, he was governor of the then Bombay Presidency. His name was Dr. Hare Krishna Mehta. He was the leader from Orissa. In 46 to uh, 52, he was the Chief Minister of Orissa. Then he came as a governor into uh, Maharashtra. Afterwards, the Bombay Presidency, and then he went back to Orissa to become Chief Minister again. This great man was a history buff. He himself was a PhD uh, uh, doctor of literature, and uh, he knew about Maratha history. Now, if you know, in uh, Mahabaleshwar used to be the uh, holiday spot for the British governors for uh, uh, summer camp because they couldn't tolerate Indian summers. So there was a governor's bungalow in Mahabaleshwar. So Hari Krishna Mehta, being a governor of Bombay, was entitled for that bungalow, and he went and stayed there in one winter, uh, one summer. and when he came out in the morning he saw there was a fortification on a mountain in the distant uh, waste so he asked his adc what are these so adc said he inquired around and he said this is pratapgarh so he said are you sure this is the same pratapgarh where chhatrapati shivaji maharaj finished off abdul khan and won the battle so he said yes sir so he said i must go there now a little bit of history here uh, hari krishna mehta was from orissa and orissa for 90 years were an under maratha administration prior to the british takeover of orissa and they had some good uh, thoughts about maratha orissa people are uh, like marathi people and uh, dr hari krishna mehta had respect for shivaji so our adc says to him sir there is no motorable road to go there he said i'm sure horses would be going hari krishna mehta was a good horseman also so he mounted a horse and along with his uh, uh, staff they all went to pratapgarh but when they went there they found a dismal scene the pratapgarh only one small tuja bhavani temple was there and that temple's pujari uh, their name was mr hadap they were doing the puja there they were the only one living on the ghat there was nobody else living he felt very odd he said sir this is a place where india's renaissance began and this is in such a shamble we must have a great statue of chhatrapati shivaji maharaj here so he went back to bombay and told the then chief minister go and put a statue there chief minister said boss there is no road going there he said precisely first make a road and then put a statue there he said there is no budget available it's a great thing that dr mehta told him i am a zamindar i have a lot of lands in orissa sell as many lands as you want to sell raise money and build a statue this actually put our chief minister i won't name the person into shame and he said sir we will find the money from somewhere and in two years they actually built a statue that statue still stands proudly it's a 17 foot tall bronze statue of chhatrapati shivaji maharaj it was inaugurated by the then prime minister nehru he is mr hare dr hare krishna mehta this is its stamp which is done by the indian government and this is the statue of chhatrapati shivaji maharaj inaugurated by prime minister nehru on 30 november 30 november 1957 a small thing a keen observer might have noticed i think the statue was made in a hurry so the uh, the sculpture made a very small error if you can see the sword in the hand of shivaji it is a curved sword as the marathas carry maratha swords were always a curved sword which are called scimitars in in the english term european term but if you can see the scabbard the, the sword is a curved sword but the scabbard is a straight scabbard of the european scabbard design this sword would never go into the scabbard or come out of it so that was a small mistake but this is the reason this whole battle of pratapgarh is called turning of tide because from then on the maratha empire spread and in the words of a uh, historian shezwalkar the country that we have today post partition is actually the places where maratha soldiers went maratha cavalry was stomping those are the places which remained in india rest all went into out of india to pakistan so this is the importance of this battle this battle started the train that's why i call it turning of the tide and this is what i wanted to explain to you the time was too short so i couldn't do really justice to this subject there are many more things in this battle as to how this psycho game was played by shivaji maharaj how the complete uh, uh, rout of abdul khan's forces was done who were the people involved kanoji jade was definitely one of them tanaji was one of them and uh, <coughs> uh, uh, many other soldiers baji prabhu deshpande was part of this and many other soldiers were there and uh, they started the movement called swaraj movement thank you very much that's it.
I think I finished in time. I'm quite sure. Of yes. <laughs> too much. Time. Perfect time. Too many things to say. <coughs> such a short time. Yeah. No problem. I, uh, I take thank you for a fabulous, fabulous talk, and we take some questions which are there. So uh, uh, the first question, which uh, one of the earliest questions which came from Vinak uh, uh, was the fact that if most of Dexter was ruled by Shia. Then yeah. around what time did we see the rise of Sunni Kokni Muslims? So how were uh, uh, local Muslims Sunni when the kings were Shia? Yeah, uh, the kings actually came as noblemen from Persia and other places, but the Kokan local caste was caste was turned into Muslim by the Arab seafarer. It started way before these uh, noble people came, and the Arab seafarers invariably were Muslim, uh, Sunni Muslim. Okay. That's it, the origin of Sunni Muslimism in Kokan. Okay. Uh, one more question related to that, uh, uh, because uh, uh, Isa is from Konkan, he's from Sindhu Durga, so he's asking yeah. a question. Yes. Um, uh, that there are many mosques in Banda, Goa, uh, and other places in Sindhu Durga, which yeah. the mention were built by Adil Shah. So, yes. uh, was this territory under Adil Shah? You know. He, yeah. Uh, actually, Goa was the territory of Vijayanagar Sultan, Vijayanagar Emperor. They were not Sultan, they were Emperors. And interestingly, when Vasco da Gama came to India, he was told by his uh, uh, king, Prince Henry, uh, King Henry, the navigator, that he has to seek places which are against Muslims. Portuguese were having sea battles, uh, naval battles with the Muslim navy all along the route, and they called used to call the Muslims moods because. Moorish were people who came into Portugal from uh, Morocco. So he said, go to places where Moors are enemies of those. Now, Vijayanagar was definitely an enemy of Moor. So Vasco de Gama and his, uh, his people actually went to Vijayanagar uh, place. And Vijayanagar then granted them asylum in Goa. So that's the genesis of Goa. And Adil Shah captured Vijayanagar territory afterwards. So Banda and all these places were captured by Adil Shah. Because remember, Konkan was with Adil Shah because of the Arab uh, seafarers who had taken some conversions in Konkan. So yes, whatever yes. was left with Adil Shah, he put the mosque there. Goa, you will see that there are no mosques. Incidentally, in Goa, even the uh, Muslims in Goa cannot have two wives because Portuguese law prevented them and the law still prevails, prevails in current Goa. <laughs> uh, there's a question about ancestry of Shivaji. So, you know, you hear so many stories about him yes. being what? Yeah, so just before the coronation, they say Gaga Bhatta got uh, his <laughs> yeah. lineage uh, yeah. of being a Sisodia Rajput, right? Okay. Uh, and hence, he had the right to be an emperor. So, was he the yeah. Sisodia? Some people say he was Kadamba. Some people say he was from the, uh, you know, Hoysal. Bhosle is another Hoysal, you know, <laughs> Marathi version okay. of Hoysal. So, there are so many theories that people come up yeah. with. Uh, what, according to you, what is uh, his... There is, a, there is a very nice saying, success has many fathers where failure is an orphan. So when a successful lord is there, everybody thinks that he has to be from their own community. I mean, this is just natural. But uh, historical proof is not there that Shivaji came from the Sisodias at all. And if you see the behavior of Shivaji, it is completely against what Rajputs used to do. Rajputs never did this kind of fighting, guerrilla fighting, except for Maharana Pratap. He was a different piece. But everywhere else you will see Rajput going headstrong into uh, Johar and all this type of thing. Guerrilla warfare and fighting for another day was not in the Rajput breed. Uh, however, as I said, Shivaji was uh, out of Marathwada. And uh, as there are 12 Mawals are there, there is a Mawal called Andar Mawal, which is close to today's Kamshek and down south. It is said that Shivaji... The clan actually originated from the Mawlas, from Andar Mawal. His build and his look also were not of the Prashput type. We can always mm -hmm. take, a, uh, take a guess now, but the original picture you see, he doesn't look like Rajput uh, type. So there is no proof. Now we can uh, believe whatever we want, but historical proof is not there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, uh, there's a question from Nikhil Varma. Uh, just Nikhil? One, one thing, just one yeah. thing. Uh, <laughs> before Shivaji was crowned king, the unfortunate part was the Brahmin said that only a person who is a true Kshatriya has a right to be king. They didn't realize he is the one who has delivered them out of the yokel of the invaders. Mm -hmm. But then it, to satisfy these people, this whole uh, Gaga Bhatta and the lineage of Sisodia and all was uh, done. 
so that nobody could then lay a finger that she was how can he become a king although this whole thing is a hoax because satavahan king he was the son of a uh, pot maker a kumbhar so there is no such thing that only kshatriya can become king but anyway i mean these are all the folklore just to take care of uh, brahmin uh, uh, satisfaction people yeah <laughs> yeah so it's, it's a, uh, go by the rules <laughs> Yes. <laughs> so he was just being compliant. He just showed that he complies by doing yeah. Right. Uh, right. <laughs> uh, um, uh, Nikhil Verma asked the question that yeah. uh, even, are there any good book books uh, if you want to know more on Maratha history, not from a point of view of a historian. Uh, yeah. Anything interesting that a layman can read, because not everybody would love to read. You know. Uh, I, I personally have gone through the entire book of uh, Gajanan Menade, which is an no, no, excellent a, book for any for historians. For all, yeah, it's yeah. meant for historians. Anybody has to go right. through, and it's like really thick. Uh, right. But for a common man, if he has to uh, understand Shivaji and later on Maratha Empire, yeah, uh, uh, which books should he look at? Actually, for everybody English, because there are a lot in Marathi. Yeah. But if in English, you can tell us. Actually, there is a there is a series of books called Marathi Riyasat by Govinda Sakaram Desai that's available in English, and I found oh. that on the net also, and that's fairly okay. accurate, and uh, it is written for the layman. Just to tell you hmm. what uh, the Riyasat business is, Govinda Sakaram Desai was actually a tutor to uh, King Sayaji Rao, uh, Sayaji Rao's son in uh, Baroda. So to teach history to his sons, he had to devise some books. These are the books he wrote for them. that's why okay. these books are uh, easy to understand they may not be completely accurate historically but they were also dependent on the kind of historical uh, evidentiary documents which were available to uh, riyasat kar sir they say at that time but this is an excellent uh, collection of books if you are interested in the military side of history then uh, colonel ravi colonel r d palsokar has written a series of books shivaji the great gorilla king is a book bajirao there is a very nice book and these books are actually giving all the campaigns in the on this pratapgarh campaign there is a book but that's unfortunately is in marathi by captain modak which gives it in detail and all the maps you saw some of them are drawn from that book but that's in marathi okay. actually we should translate right. that in english so i, I think so uh, you should be writing a book uh, which is easy for people to understand <laughs> making it easy you know these yeah, uh, parts of history uh, right. from a point of view right uh, yeah. there's a mention of uh, uh, i think nupur has mentioned that uh, Uh, there is a book uh, shivaji the great so shriman yogi in marathi by uh, ranjit desai yeah, the english version is available which is called uh, shivaji the great maratha oh great then that would be a good book to read although yeah. always remember that's a novel so novel yeah. fictionalization is done a little bit but they stay yeah. true, true to the main events of the uh, right career okay. so, so uh, another question that nupur is asking is uh, Uh, Shivaji Maharaj was a far-sighted ruler, so he must yeah. be having a backup plan in case uh, there's a failure in this. Yes, system. yes. Good, very what good was question. The Actually, what he said, he said to his, he already had a son by then, Sambaji, but he was hardly two or three years of age. But his mother, Jija Bai, was a good administrator herself. In fact, before Shivaji came of an age, the Jija Bai was doing the administration of the Jagir along with Dadoji Konde and other officers. So he had told that in case I don't come back. then you have to raise this son uh, sambhaji till he comes of an age and you as a jijabai as the regent mother uh, she will be grandmother then regent grandmother and you all will be the office bearers of this uh, small raj and you have to make sure till he comes of an age the raj is kept intact and then he will take the uh, take the task forward so that is all the speech he gave but incidentally like many people in serials also they show that before going down to uh, meet our uh, abdul khan shivaji met his mother and uh, unke pair chuke gaye but unfortunately that's not true shivaji's mother was in rajgarh she was not in pratapgarh in fact shivaji was such a wise ruler he would never keep all the eggs in one basket what if he is defeated and pratapgarh is not taken care of so his mother and his son were on rajgarh they were not on pratapgarh so that's why this alternate plan backup plan uh, sir can i request you something can you unshare your ppt so that i can put up the forthcoming events as we talk yeah yeah i will do that just a moment so uh, there's a comment by vinayak salwar he says because he is researching on the area around uh, uh, he is researching on the area around uh, uh, prabha devi and okay. in prabha devi he said that uh, uh, there is this uh, sculptor there was sculpting studio in prabha devi 
by okay. a, a sculptor called Ram Kramat. And Ram Kramat. Uh, okay. Ram Kramat's son is now a doctor, I think. So ENT specialist who has okay. a clinic in the same place. Okay. And he's the guy who made the statue at Pratapgarh. Oh, interesting. I was looking for that. See, what has happened? The statue is 17 feet tall, as I said, and it is mounted on a pedestal which is around 20 feet high. And yeah. unfortunately, the name of the sculptor is at the base of the statue. So you either need a giraffe or a periscope to read that name. So I was not able to read that name. It is too far up there. Somebody should, a yeah. should put a plaque below that. Very good. I wanted yeah. to know this information. Thanks, yeah. thanks uh, for that. Uh, one interesting yeah. piece of information I will give. On the yeah. base of Pratapgarh, at the, there are some villages where a family called Butala stay. Now this Butala yeah. family is a trader family and they yeah. actually come from Surat. I met the, one of the members of Butala family. They have taken up the refortification of the damaged portion of Pratapgarh on their own uh, expenses. They said okay. that when Shivaji uh, looted Surat the second time, he saw a group of people forlornly standing like our migrant labor on the outside of Surat at that time. So he inquired after them and they said, sir, we used to work in this town, but now we can't work in this town. It's not safe anymore. So he said, what do you know? He said, we are traders. He said, I need traders for my kingdom. Come, I will give you shelter. That's how they came and they uh, scattered themselves around in near uh, Pratapgarh. So there are a lot of Butalas near Pratapgarh. There are some of them, many of them in Mumbai also. It's a big clan. One of these days we should go and meet them. They may be having some old documents also. Hmm. This piece of information is not available anywhere. Okay. Uh, there is a question uh, by, by Isa, and I'm going to because he is fascinated with his own village. So he's asking about oh, okay. Dutch factory in Vengurla. Yes. Uh, what was the influence of Dutch? So I'm just uh, widening it to what was the interaction between the European uh, European uh, uh, presence in yes. India at that point and Shivaji? Any uh, what was the yeah, kind of interaction? Definitely. See, Shivaji, being a foresighted person, he understood the value of technology. He hmm. couldn't replicate that technology at this at this point, but he then realized that the technology is coming. For example, a small telescope. A small, it is rumored that Shivaji had a piece of telescope, which is a big help in battle formation because you can see from afar what the enemy is doing. And that telescope was available from this British or the Dutch or the French. Now, French were not present in Maharashtra at all, but the Dutch were present. So Shivaji played one against the another. And also for ammunition, he had to take ammunition from these British and uh, uh, European traders. So Dutch also he kept on his uh, uh, beck and call. And they also wanted to deal with Shivaji because Shivaji was against Portuguese. Portuguese were the enemies of both the British and the Dutch. So Shivaji was a dear to at that time. Later on things changed. But Shivaji was a darling to them. And actually the things changed from the British perspective when Shivaji started developing his navy. Once he developed the navy, British realized what really is happening. Their own future was at stake. Dutch were not a strong presence at all because Dutch actually made the, most of their money from uh, Indonesia which uh, they used to call Batavia and all the uh, long, that is clover trade and uh, spice trade, Dutch did from there. What Dutch actually did was bring in a lot of silver into India because Indian kings and uh, emperors always needed silver to mint coins. And as you know, there is no silver mine in India. So Dutch used to bring the silver. In return, they will take cloth from Surat. From Baroj, they will take cloth to Muscat. They will sell it there. But where the spice trade was there, Shivaji was of help to them. In fact, Dutch history records have a lot of mention of Shivaji. Okay, uh, you know, uh, when when stories are told to children in Maharashtra, there's mm -hmm. one character that he is told about is Bharji Naik. Yeah. And uh, so, w was he actually the kind of person he is? What is his contribution? If you can tell us something more. Yeah. You see, Shivaji had the best espionage system in the Middle Ages. He always knew what, like I told you, when Abdul Khan said that he is going to capture Shivaji, Shivaji's people told him post haste. So he knew what is happening, what was his preparation, what are his intentions. The reason is he employed a network of spies. It is said that Shivaji spent a lot of money on his spies. He knew that that was money well spent. Most of the Indian kings didn't even understand the concept of spies. In fact, many of them treated spies as something immoral. And in the mm -hmm. many, we can also have Murarji Desai as one of the persons who treated spies as immoral and he disbanded mm -hmm. raw when he came to power. Such were, the, oh. such were the people we had. So even in those times, but Shivaji was not such a person. So Bahirji Naik is more likely an institution because if you know who Bahirji is, 
that means his importance is gone isn't it james bond is only available in movies you don't know who the james bond is otherwise they will be spotted by the enemy so they were always below the surface and they will report separately to the king it won't be even recorded but the money he spent was in record somewhere so we know that a lot of money exchanged uh, uh, hands when shivaji was there so there is a single person bahir ji i don't think it is possible okay okay so uh, let's take it slightly forward in terms of uh, uh, post uh, the death of uh, yes. chhatrapati shivaji yeah Uh, Shivaji, you said. Oh, sorry. I wanted to tell about Abdul Khan also a little bit because yeah, was, yeah, please. Yeah, when Abdul Khan died, uh, you know who had a great uh, sigh of relief. It was actually uh, Aurangzeb because Aurangzeb knew as long as Abdul Khan is in the court of Vijapur, Vijapur was not uh, easy to conquer. Once Abdul uh, Khan died, he said, "Now Vijapur is in my grip, but now the new problem is Shivaji, who actually killed Abdul Khan." So then he concentrated his effort on to Shivaji. So Vijapur became weakened. but two things mm-hmm. one is abdul khan's death secondly their source of horses was dried up the other places they got their horses imported were from machli pattanam in uh, on the on the east coast of india but shivaji mm-hmm. put a stop to that also when he went and won pondicherry from the french mm-hmm. so the, even mm-hmm. the uh, east coast was not available to the adil shah so they completely mm-hmm. dilapidated so this is what mm-hmm. happened and now you want to know post shivaji so uh, the question is uh, and this is these are comments which i keep on hearing i am not a yes, historian yes. and uh, maratha history is not something that i have understood in great amount of detail uh, but they say shivaji looked at is as a local rule right uh, yes. deccan for deccan and yeah. uh, they say it bajira who changed it to india for indian so uh-huh. uh, uh, do you look at it that way how much of the later empire Uh, yeah. relied on the ideals that shivaji uh, cherished actually at the time of shivaji's death his plan was quite quite well made it is written in some documents he said mm. that it's definite that aurangzeb is going to come to invaders down here now we mm. alone cannot face aurangzeb so we had to create a unity of the deccan state that's why that uh, deccan for deccan is so he actually mm. he made alliances with the qutub shah alliances with adil shah saying that we mm. all together can only defeat uh, at least withstand aurangzeb that was point 1 secondly he had been to agra he was the only one who had been to agra from the erstwhile rulers so he knew the nature of the mughal empire he knew that the rajputs and all are under the yokel but if we managed to break this yokel he was sure that some rajputs would break away actually bundelaj was another thing uh, chatrasal bundelaj took his inspiration from shivaji he came to shivaji and he said i want to join your forces shivaji very correctly told him that you go to your land learn whatever you want from me but if you join me all the wins will be my wins you go to your land free your land of the mogal yokel and this was the inspiration he was giving to the north as well but the mm-hmm. point here is in his time the empire was much smaller i don't think mm. he would have hoped to go to atok and all that thing in fact when mm. he was captured at agra there was a talk mm. of sending him to kabul to mm. as a force to uh, win back the kandahar and kabul castles thank mm. god that that didn't happen and he could run away in good time mm. otherwise that was the plan to send him to kabul as uh, many of the uh, rajputs were sent to die in kabul and all those fronts so shivaji yeah. i don't think would have the complete but one point is still there shivaji always maintained that kashi mathura are the uh, holy cities of india kashi mathura ayodhya are the holy cities of our local hindu people and they must be free of foreign influence so his vision reached up to there that is for sure yeah okay uh, uh uh later on uh do you look at really so in uttar peshwai so second half yeah. of the uh, of the 18th century uh, yeah. do you look at it as Uh, a maratha empire or mostly it was a confederacy it so, was a con- it was a confederacy and it was a confederacy because after the death of shivaji as we were talking just now uh, there is one point of one angle of shivaji we should do a separate uh, lecture on that the civic yeah. administration of shivaji because people don't fight just because you give them that i am shivaji i am shivaji people fight if you give them a good and safe life after coming from agra shivaji declared a unilateral truce with the mughals he actually sent a letter to aurangzeb 
in today's parlance it would be he said ki i am sorry i had to come back without taking a proper casual leave but wife was not well so i had to come back so sorry about that aurangzeb also realized once to panchi ud gaya hai abhi jhagda karne se kya fayda so he said although i didn't like the way you went but keep uh, keep your faith in the emperor and we will look after you so the idea was the truce was kept because he wanted to put together the good administration he always wanted to have all the uh, years of jai singh and all these fights were there people were not able to live normal life for four years vijay has not fought a single battle remember he kept on improving the lot of the his uh, uh, people it, he improved it to such an extent that after shivaji's death the people fought because they liked the life shivaji gave them there was no leader sambhaji died 9 years after shivaji died there was absolutely no leader rajaram was away at jinji and tarabai his wife was leading the campaign but aurangzeb with all his might of mughal empire and by then he had finished off adil shah qutub shah and all that business but the marathas kept fighting because of the dream of swarajya which shivaji gave them and he had made the dream a reality during those four years this aspect of shivaji if today's rulers also realize that is the secret of success and not just by putting a bhagwa dhwaj and then crying and all you give a good life you give a corruption free life you give a safe life people will raise for him yeah interesting um all, all these uh, description of afzal khan being able to bend the iron rod pull uh-huh. up the cannon which was stuck in a pit and so are these really documented or all these uh, made part of they, they are mostly folklore see afzal khan was a very important member of the court he was very rich also he had a big jagir and all i am sure people would be able to write good things about him like we do see a lot of writings about our current political leaders that they are supermen nothing short of that so it was written for abdul khan also one story although is said about the bijapur uh, folklore that once abdul khan was not getting noticed by anybody so once a, a noble person was going on his elephant and abdul khan came behind the elephant and held the elephant by his tail and he was so strong the elephant was not able to move so the nobleman talked to his mahot that why why are you not going he said elephant is stuck then he saw this boy is holding the elephant by his own arms then he took abdul khan under his wing and that was the rise of abdul khan so that story is there otherwise most of it bending rods and all you know i mean you can write about anybody nobody has shown you the rod right uh one more question uh yeah. most of the administration in the uh, in shivaji's regime uh, yeah. was not hereditary right people yes. were given Very a salary good. they didn't have jagir Very and whatever what yeah. changed in later years and was it responsible to a great extent of the later downfall of maratha empire yes. whether Very it was so. it was uh, it was the navy or the peshwas being made hereditary uh, was it the reason for downfall uh, yes. one and uh, what was the importance of the ashtapradan mandal uh, his cabinet the yeah. eight people in his cabinet both both aspects so w- what he looked at it at that point of time right. and what happened when it became tradition you know hereditary see, see in the time he was growing up he was saying that the people with a hereditary watan watan means a piece of land owned by your uh, uh, khandan forever they were always trying to sell their motherland if their land if their watan can be saved so he had a, a, a hatred towards this watandari concept and that's the reason he said that in my rule nobody will be given a watan he didn't give watan to anybody he said you you do good job for the uh, country we'll pay you from that payment you buy land and become your own nobody is taking away your hereditary from your bought land but government will not give you the office as a hereditary in fact shivaji is the first person to have started a indian civil service i wish that our ias people realize this that the indian civil service because civil service means what anybody can pass exam and become an administrator that was shivaji's idea so all these ashta pradhan mandal none of them was hereditary but after the death of shivaji where the, where was there to take exam and all the whole maratha uh, empire was in a disarray so it started going the hereditary way then when shahu and tarabai started fighting among themselves the only way to retain the fighters on shahu's side was to promise them watan because that's the only thing they knew they said now you give me watan i will be on your side so actually interestingly enough rajaram used to give watan and all the watan will be in the mogal territory somebody will be very happy to see that he has been watan in agra there was no way to <laughs> go to agra you will say go and win it it is all yours 
this was the kind of dream. <laughs> so you had to start this Vatandari system per force. It was never the intention. Mm -hmm. And after that, what happened? Shahu, Shahu himself was no fighter, unfortunately. He was a good man, mm -hmm. but he was uh, not, not fighting himself. Alaji Bajira was not a good fighter either. He was a cunning man. He was a prime minister. But you know, the, the prime minister, uh, uh, Narendra Modi and uh, General Rawat are different people. They have different professional mm -hmm. qualities. So the General Rawats of those area, those days, like Kanoji, Angre and all, they will fight only if the button was given to them. Mm -hmm. So what, the, uh, what uh, Balaji Vishwanath did, he told all of these people that let us start a confederacy. Whatever you win will be yours, but you have to have allegiance to Shahu. And then there was a share of the revenue. Some share has to come to Shahu, some has to come to Peshwa. Rest all they will keep. In the later years, you will see that Peshwa started getting poorer and poorer. And all the Malara Holkar, Ranoji, uh, Sindhya, the uh, Bhosleys of Nagpur, they all started getting much more richer because they were sitting on the till. It is said that the, the one who sits on the till actually takes maximum amount out of it. There are a lot of accounting gaplas done at that time, but those are for another day. But because of that, they started thinking that I rule this land. I, I rule in the name of Peshwa, that's all okay. Mm. This is all used to happen, if you remember, in the days of Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru, our CMs were extremely powerful. Indira mm. Gandhi changed that rule and she made the CMs responsible only to Indira Gandhi. That's when mm. actually all the CMs, Babaji Bhusle and all these great people mm. came to power just mm. because they were uh, like Indira's nominee. That, mm. that is a way of ruling in the strong center. India needed a strong center rule at that time, but there was no way it could be done. Till Bajirao, it could still be done because Bajirao himself was the fighter. After mm. Bajirao, uh, you know, Nana Sahib himself was a more of an administrator than a fighter. And slowly it started uh, dawning on the Holkars and Sindhyas. You know, the Holkars and Sindhyas, their, uh, their land holdings were so much, so big land holdings that they were actually emperors in their own, own uh, reckoning. And they wouldn't listen to any other bullshit. They will just say, you lip service. So, so Bosla's importance completely went away. Bosla's were only given a small 1% or 2% of the revenue to maintain their own princely lifestyle, nothing more. And this actually created India into fragments, which was the way it was. But remember, even before India was not a one single country, Mughals also had different Subhas and Subedars were powerful. Only the mm. emperor was a very ruthless person, so he will kill any Subedar who went out of his line. So that's how he mm. kept the power on. Mm. That okay. uh, Nikhil Verma is asking that, uh, uh, you know, uh, many of these royal families or these famous characters, do we have descendants today? Uh, are there any books on the research about descendants? So whether it is Ajay Chai, uh, uh -huh. Uh, whether it is Tipu Sultan, Abdul Khan, are there descendants today alive who can who talk about them? Something, the, the only one I have been able to find is actually Bajirao had a, another wife called Mastani. And Mastani's uh, family, I know up to nine generation unbroken. Actually, the current, uh, current descendant is a friend of mine. He considers mm -hmm. me as his uh, senior friend. And he has, he has shown me his lifeline that it's a continuous bloodline till him. But apart from him, everywhere else, you find that there are no lifelines going on. They all actually trickle at some place. Then there are a lot of adoptions done. In fact, Lord Dalhousie was a very smart guy. There is an apocryphal tale that he took hold of one Pandey or somebody from Nagpur. And he told him to write a special uh, kind of adoption uh, principle, a pothi of adoption. And it was made in such a way that all adoptions which were done not according to the pothi were considered as illegal. Jasi Rani case is exactly like that. Jasi mm -hmm. Rani, she didn't have a kid of her own, so she adopted. Mm -hmm. And Dalhousie wanted to take control of Jasi, so he said this adoption is illegal. That's how Jasi, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Rani Jasi had to fight her way out and ultimately mm -hmm. went uh, without success. So this mm -hmm. way, many of our rulers actually died childless. Mahathir Sinde was mm -hmm. one such. Why many? Mm -hmm. Malara Olkar had only one son who died. There is no continuance. Then it is all an adoption kind of thing. So whenever they trade, whenever they tell that they are, uh, you know, descendants, actually there is no DNA descendants. The descendants in paper can be anything. Bosla, there is no DNA descendants. Current uh, kings and queens of Bosla uh, family, they are from some different families. They are not, uh, the, the bloodline doesn't exist. The only bloodline of Peshwa exist, existed, existed till 1910 when the daughter of uh, second Bajirao, her name was Bayabai, Bayabai Apte. She died in 1910 childless. 
so that was the end of the peshwa bloodline that bloodline thrives in the mastani is vamsha uh, anyway bajirao's bloodline is still around so th this is, there is an interesting book in fact we must have it in our collection it is called the wicked women of raj Mm. Book tells about women which the British specifically introduced to kings and queens to make sure that they wouldn't produce anything further. How they did it, I don't know. But. <laughs> <laughs> very very interesting. Very very interesting. Great. Yeah. Um, I think so. We have come at the end of our Q and A. Uh, uh, it was great talking to you. Uh, I am sure a lot of people will look at Maratha history differently. Those who have not been exposed yeah. to Maratha history. Uh, and uh, we can always recommend them books there are a lot of books in our uh, yeah. library itself library itself do do you think uh, uh, this is the greatest battle of shivaji or was there any battle which is greater than uh, as a you know this is not only shivaji are there any examples of one royal person killing the other in a one on one meeting we don't see that anywhere so as a personal mm. triumph i think this is the greatest triumph of shivaji but as mm. battles go his great battle was in wani wani dindori mm. near nashik mm. where the mm. first time ever i think this is also another turning point we should talk about that uh, when he came from surat the second time when he looted surat he was stopped by uh, a mogal uh, uh, subedar uh, in near uh, nashik near wani in nashik and mogal subedar mm. was put a position on the open ground and shivaji didn't run away he gave battle on the open ground and soundly defeated the mughals so this was another turning point that the marathas the local army can defeat mughals on open ground as well we showed the power of marathas so that battle in my opinion is the best and if you want to know in pune there is a statue in ssp ms of shivaji uh, made by a sculptor called uh, kurmarkar on the statue on the three sides of the pedestal there are panels in one panel mm. shivaji is shown mm. in that battle of ani dindori and he said mm. i chose this battle because it was shivaji himself took part and it was the first mm. open uh, ground battle which marathas gave and won the battle so that showed the confidence marathas has got actually when aurangzeb was in maharashtra even while he was alive marathas had started raiding malwa so aurangzeb said mm. here i have come to capture you and you are actually tearing away my territory one by one <laughs> so he died a very vain and disappointed person so uh, that should be your next topic uh, of uh, giving talk the battle of 27 years from oh yes of that's, Shivaji that's in 1680 uh, yeah. right up till 1707 when uh, aurangzeb yes. died so those we, we can do that will, actually yeah, 27 years and uh, and the other topic i would like you to take up some day would be dakshin digvijay uh, the southern oh, yes. conquest of shivaji of shivaji the strategic depth that he planned for That's you know you know something interesting the the amount yeah. of territory shivaji won in dakshin dikvijay was three yeah. times the territory himself had so okay. people don't realize <laughs> the importance of this thing because they are not in the part of the folklore but yes we will yeah. definitely do the 27 years 27 years the beauty is aurangzeb was fighting an idea called shivaji and yeah. idea can never be killed that's why aurangzeb yeah. lost the idea yeah. of shivaji and swarajya was rooted firmly into the minds of the uh, citizens and they kept fighting this is the only time again in indian history uh, right from vedas time when the janata the common men fought without a leader normally our tradition is when the leader falls everybody runs away here there was yeah. no leader to fall so they just kept fighting they said this guy has cannot go back alive he had to be buried in maharashtra and he was buried in kuldabad as you we all know yeah. very yeah. opposite the devgiri fort but yeah. i must mention here that i am very thankful to khaki for giving me this opportunity because some of the views i give are counter narratives you don't get places to give counter narratives to discerning audience khaki mm. used me the chance to do that and i am really grateful for that thank you very much bharat and the khaki team uh, okay uh, most of you would probably don't know that uh, uh, mr uh, nene also takes great interest in middle eastern history right for oh, yes. the entire islamic world he is fascinated yeah. with that and uh, hence sneha uh, uh, is requesting you you should also do a talk on mehmed the second's con conquering of istanbul the way you oh, narrated right. it to her it should uh, be a full presentation yes, yes. of how you know how the battle took place and how yes. uh, you know gun talk was the... used and all those fascinating yeah, yeah. stories which are Correct. yeah we'll do that 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 is another turning point you say we should do a turning points kind of series i just yeah, 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 certainly Because yeah yeah they, certainly. they are actually turning points including caesar's win in uh, the parliament or whatever they call incidentally <laughs> i am intending to do one for some other people on gilgit yeah. baltistan so if you are interested oh, in, 
that is the current uh, history as we talk yeah yeah so we can kashmir campaign itself is a very fascinating time to talk yeah so <laughs> sure, sure. let's plan wonderful not many sessions to come yes uh, thank you everybody for coming and with that we come to the end of this uh, session you can see the four forthcoming talks which are there please do register for them uh, it will be a great pleasure and i'll be requesting dr kumut kanetkar to give a talk on uh, amarnath temple <laughs> very very soon so thank you everybody thank and you hope to see you soon okay sure thank you anybody wants to say anything to mr nene you can unmute yourself and uh, give your viewpoint if you want to uh sir uh, i'm nikhil here i actually was just looking for the book uh, you suggested by uh, uh, sir desai uh, on yeah, marathi riyas sir no unfortunately that book is not available on amazon i quickly looked at amazon uh, uh, there is another book available from him uh, which is basically about uh, it has got a different topic but it talks about marathi riyas sir that is available actually so just want to know whether that book also will suffice because my idea is you see i am not a maharashtrian i don't know how to read marathi i just understand but i am very much interested now having been settled in uh, maharashtra i would like to understand the history of maratha uh, the entire history of marathas uh, as a non history uh, historian or a history student so uh, in english what would be the best book see i have tried to buy the book of uday kulkarni uh, but first of all that is for a limited period number one and number two that is not available also i have in fact written to him that it is not uh, available uh, amazon only displays it but is not available so uh, i would request sir if you can uh, suggest the name of one or two books which are basically see we are not people who can devote full time you know we just read maybe one hour a day or something like that so if you can just suggest one or two books for people like me in english about the maratha history uh that will be really good sir yeah uh, i will create a list uh, nikhil uh, in which i will also mention which of them are available in ebook format and the location which then you can go and download see the beauty of riyasat is there are at least uh, 11 uh, no not 11 9 volumes of riyasat they cover a period right from muhammad the first i mean the the paigambar muhammad up to the uh, british uh, occupation there are two books called british riyasat uh, seven books called marathi riyasat two books called muslimani riyasat and some of them are available in english so i'll search which ones are available and i will give sir, the uh, secondly sir uh, unlike a uh, place like delhi where you have lot of book markets i mean you can uh -huh. go and buy books on any subject unfortunately uh -huh. in mumbai we really don't have that even in pune you have lot of book markets near shanivar wada but right. in uh, mumbai somehow we don't get to uh, you know buy books uh, uh, i don't know mumbai maybe is too busy making money i don't know whatever <laughs> so flora fountain or area yeah, around flora fountain yeah but they are you know they are not organized sector so you yeah, really yeah, don't right. you somehow you know yeah. uh, you you step on some book by luck but There if you want to actually are looking for some book sometimes it's, uh, most of the time it is not available so uh, if you mm -hmm. can suggest a book shop in mumbai or some way because you know many of these books unfortunately not available on amazon also or oh, flipkart that's why we created the khaki lab yeah <laughs> yeah also book ganga you can try book ganga will have more english books also i am sure Where they they book? give <laughs> book ganga is in pune by the way but they are Achha. on the net so they they actually send books by on the net by courier currently they don't because there are no couriers okay. but once the courier service starts they do give those books and some of them are in english i will search for them also they are actually in pune in uh, sevagad road their actual office okay. but mumbai mein to office the but majestic is a good bookshop which is in dadar in shivaji mandir they will have some good collection and majestic majestic bookshop wo so shivaji mandir theater in dadar mein same ah. building they okay. have a bookshop okay. 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 so you can visit them strand used to be a good one and uh, but now i think it's all defunct right bharat strand to band ho gaya na <laughs> yeah, but uh, everybody employed in Strand is now with uh, Kitab Khana. So you can... Ah, Kitab Khana is there actually. Why not? You, you should look at Kitab Khana. They have a good collection. Sir, unfortunately, I mean, I'm just taking one minute more of yours. Yeah, go, unfortunately, no, the problem with people who are interested in history like me uh -huh. is that either we have one side of people who are representing an entirely nationalistic view, which may not be true. Yeah. It may be slightly, you know, making giving their point of view. Right. or there is a point of view which the way britishers saw us right. uh, the real That's history different. of you know there are historical facts which probably have been concealed for whatever reason mm -hmm. so yeah. objective non critical unbiased 
kind of a historical narrative is very difficult to find and uh, huh? yeah so i i am actually looking for people who write like today one of the best authors uh, who is most popular is a british that is william darrell bell unfortunately yeah. he also has his own uh, you Bias. know biases in favor Biases of will be there. in a very yeah. subtle way so yeah, that is true getting to see history authors who are unbiased and also not going into very academic detail like we don't want to i don't want to write a civil services exam in history correct, correct. i want to read okay. history to know my heritage to know where i come right. from where my country belongs to uh -huh. so for that uh, i'm actually hungry about you know getting authors who are very objective unfortunately see, they are not so so many one good source is actually lancer publications of delhi they okay. publish some really good they are more towards the military history but they publish some really good uh, mm. books which are mainly about uh, an uh, what i will say objective way the books are written i okay. like some of their books they are actually the publishers for colonel parsokar also colonel parsokar is no more now but he has written books for the indian military they are used in the military colleges oh but he is also quite uh, lucid about many ideas which otherwise we don't have like we only hear of a battle we don't know the logistics of a battle and all yes. the fun starts when the logistics starts failing this uh, abdul khan business he was brought in such a way that all his battle equipment had to be abandoned because it couldn't be carried through the mountainous passes and couldn't cross rivers that was a beautiful strata game uh, you bring everything and leave it for the shivaji people to capture that was exactly what happened <laughs> right sir. but people don't realize what happened then right. so this thank is the logistics thank you sir thank you for your time sir it's a pleasure it's a pleasure talking oh. with somebody interested yeah <laughs> <laughs> okay so with that we end the session yeah, yeah. so thank you okay. thank you thank you bharat thank you.